Thank you for tuning in to this 11th episode of the Old Code Podcast. I'm recording this on Friday, the 29th of December, but this is coming out on New Year's Day, so Happy New Year's. I hope that this year brings peace and joy. I hope that you are able to pursue goodness and virtue, find the truth, and see more beauty. Today we're talking about the necessity for studying the things that we're talking about. Today we're talking about, particularly I want to talk about philosophy, uh, but this applies to the other things that I've included in the show notes, literature, history, art, theology. Why, why should we study these things? In particular, philosophy. Because history is a little bit easier to understand. His, the study of history is, you know, best encapsulated by the Trojan horse, the story of the Trojan horse. It's the desire to not see history repeat itself. You know, we, we constantly draw on the imagery from history to understand the present it's one of the reasons why the concept of revisionist history has started becoming so popular, because we view the present through the lens of the past, but if you can change the way we view the past, then you can rewrite the narrative of the very present that we look at. So we study history and we read old books because, first of all, it helps us to learn old lessons that we should have learned by now. But more so, it ought to re remind us that history is just filled with more people. You find absolute treasures and gems all throughout history. And you are reminded that these aren't just odd creatures in the past. These are people. They're people living their lives. Like when you hear, I don't remember the names in the story, but one of my favorite stories from, I believe it was the history of Japanese warfare comes, from, or no, it was Chinese warfare. Anyway, I'll correct it in the show notes. But it's the story of these two generals who were very familiar with each other, and they were on opposite sides of the battlefield. And one of them had a full army, the other was defending a fort with barely 20 men. And so the, when the those defending the fort decided to basically sit outside and have a tea party, posing themselves like they were setting a trap for the other side. And the one general on with the full army sees this and goes, well, that clearly looks like a trap. Could, could it be a trap? And then he looks and goes at the, he knows exactly the general on the other side, and he goes, he would know that I would think that he was faking me out. So it actually is a trap. And so they decided to run away. And I think that that's absolutely hilarious and brilliant. The fact that history is made up of weird little stories like that. Um, history is not just full of lessons. It's full of reminders that we have come from people and we're, going to be a part of history one day too whether we're rem where whether we are remembered by history is another thing but history is made up of people so one reason to to study history um and i'm sure i'll do a full episode on each of these subjects literature is another easy one it's philosophy embodied literature and art are philosophy embodied by the culture particularly you see this in art especially in music literature art they all effectively embody 
what the culture believes and what it is most important at the time. Um, I'll, I'll do another full episode on that as well in the future. But again, I, I really should just circle back to focus in on philosophy. Why should we study philosophy? Why should we care about philosophy? Why should we care about things that dead people said 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago even? Why should we care about any of this? And the fact of the matter is, is that question itself is a philosophical question. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, a know-it-all teenager when I say that, but it's making a philosophical claim when one says philosophy isn't important. And it, it, it really is. And I want to give credit where credit is due. This episode was inspired by a good friend and listener of this show who recommended the topic. And so you know who you are. Thank you so much for giving the idea. And back to it. Um, philosophy, when you get down to it, when you break it down, philosophy means the love of wisdom. Philosophia, it's two Greek words. Philo meaning to, or philo meaning to love, and then Sophia being wisdom. It's the love of wisdom. And I think first, before we move any further, I'd like to define wisdom, going back to the transcendental episode. Knowledge is knowing what is true. Wisdom is knowing what is good. And it's knowing what is the good or virtuous behavior in a given context. And a lot of you, or some of you may be thinking, how, how on earth did philosophy end up the way that it is, if that's what philosophy was always meant to be? And I actually have a quote. Let me pull that up really quick. I have a quote from an old samurai, Yamamoto Tsunetomo. I'm butchering that name. Tsunetomo. Yeah, there we go. Uh, from his book, The Hagakuri. Um, and it says, people think that they can clear up profound matters if they consider them deeply. But they exercise perverse thoughts and come to no good because they do their reflecting with only self-interest at the center. And really, I want to say that that's, that's, the, that's the rub of why philosophy has ended up the way it is today. It's not the love of wisdom anymore. It's self-reflection. It's ref meditation. But there's no desire for goodness or virtue. And in that, there's no pursuit of truth or beauty. That's what philosophy was meant to be. It was meant to be the pursuit of goodness. It was meant to be the pursuit of, of wisdom. Um, I'll, I'm going to quote several times throughout this, uh, this episode. But the poetic Edda phrases it like this. No better burden a man can carry on the road than a store of common sense. Better than riches it will seem in an unfamiliar place, such as the resort of the wicked. Um, and really, yeah, just focusing on that first part, there's no better burden a man can carry on the road than a store of common sense. That's what wisdom is. Common sense is knowing what is not only true, but what is right, what is good. So when we're studying the old philosophers, especially the ancient philosophers, I, I, and I'll lay my cards out, I do not like, I pretty much don't like anybody post-enlightenment as far as philosophy. I will study the medieval Christian philosophers. I'll study the early church philosophers. 
study the Greek and the Romans, the Stoics, the Platonists, the Aristotelians. Um, I'll even study some of the Eastern sometime. Uh, like I quoted from the Hagakuri, I will study Mencius and Confucius on occasion. But anybody post post enlightenment, they're not actually trying to study wisdom anymore. Uh, and the, the the I I briefly covered this in the episode on social media, but effectively post enlightenment philosophy just became about knowledge and how do you know anything. Um, and so everything after that just became what's called epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. And it also became about linguistics because you have got basically two things. You've got your own internal knowledge and then how do you communicate that knowledge? And that's language. So language philosophy, um, anything postmodern, I find disgusting. The, a lot of the French postmodernists were pedophiles. Um, a lot of the German deconstructionists were Marxists and functionally atheistic. I think that I can comfortably say that one of the few last actual philosophers, and this is kind of a stretch and sad to say, but one of the few last actual philosophers in the public eye is someone like Jordan Peterson, who his entire schema is centered around how does one live a good life? How does one be a functional human? And these are the same questions that Plato and Aristotle were trying to answer. Like when, when Aristotle is trying to discern what the substance of the soul is, he's not just asking questions to be a, a know-it-all. He's asking questions because he's genuinely curious. What is this thing that seems to be animating us? What is it? What's the difference between a dead body and a living body? When Plato is asking, or Socrates are asking these these questions and probing the sophists of the time, they're not just asking questions to ask questions. They're trying to plumb the depths of what one can know through philosophy alone, through reason alone. And so I'd like to give you a couple more quotes. Um, and I, I would, I, I will say this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's our, our starting point. We start from that position and say, our knowledge and fear of God is going to determine the manner in which we live our lives. If you do not fear God, if you do not fear, yeah, if you do not fear God, you are not going to try to pursue a good life. You are not going to try to pursue a, a holy life, a righteous life, a virtuous life, because you have no reason to. If you do not love God, you have no reason to do good. If you do not fear God, you have no reason to avoid evil. So we start off with understanding that philosophy for many, especially among the pagans, was trying to understand what goodness looked like. So uh, Seneca in his letters from a Stoic writes this, it is clear, Lucilius, that no man can live a happy life or even a supportable life without the study of wisdom. You know also that a happy life is reached when our wisdom is brought to completion, but that life is at least endurable even when our wisdom is only begun. So he's writing in the Stoic context of understanding that there are certain things we can control and certain things that we can't control. And when you your life is dominated by the concerns of things that one cannot control, one will never be happy. 
when you are constantly anxious about what you cannot control in your life. You're never going to be happy. And you can see that today in this very day and age. You see people fretting and concerning about all of the things that they have no business trying to control. And they end up having crippling anxiety. Why do you think that social media and Google, having presented us with more information on more world conflicts and more issues of cultural injustice. Why do you think teens and millennials have the highest rate of anxiety of this day and age? It's because they are fretting about things that they have no control over. Social anxiety is fretting about something you literally have zero control over. You are fretting about the way people perceive you. You cannot control the way other people perceive you. And all of these lessons, they, like, and this is just one field of thought, one application of one field of thought, and that's Stoicism, and that's a form of philosophy. And all of these things are bound up in this amorphous field that's, uh, that people don't want to touch. And I think it, it partially comes down to American slash modern anti-intellectualism they're worried about coming across as a know-it-all or something because they study philosophy. <clears throat> but when you have this wisdom stored up in your head for the application of the heart, you're, you're not left empty-handed when life asks you hard questions. So another example is, and of course, as Christians, we have a very clear and obvious answer to this. But when you have the opportunity to do something that is wrong, and you know, no one is going to catch you. Why should you not do it? So as Christians, we have the obvious answer of because it's a sin and that sin is deserving of death and hell. That's the honest answer. But we can also flesh that out a little bit further. Again, going back to a different Stoic, Epictetus in his book Discourses. What does the debauchee lose? Manhood. What does he lose who made him such? The qualities of a modest man, the chaste character, the good neighbor. What does the angry person lose? A coward, each to his portion. No one was wicked without some loss or damage. And the reason why I'm bringing this quote up is because, again, this is a philosophical statement that when one engages in cowardice or impropriety or undue wrath, you're not just acting out of turn with goodness. You are damaging yourself. You're losing something of yourself. And this is a philosophical statement. There, I, I wish I could just relay all of the amazing and meaningful quotes that I have found over the course of my reading but why should you study philosophy? First of all, because it, in it is bound up beautiful and countless meditations and answers on problems that we're going to face. And going back to what I said about history, these are people and they're dealing with surprisingly similar problems to what you have today. Some of the earliest and oldest written documents that we have carved in clay tablets from linear B script in ancient, ancient, ancient Greece to Mesopotamia are receipts from exchanges of goods and services. 
these are people that have been dealing with the same stuff that we've been dealing with. There's graffiti on the walls of uh, Vesuvius in the town. Uh, in the town, there's graffiti in. There was graffiti in ancient Rome. These are people, and they are dealing with the exact same troubles that you are dealing with today. So that's reason number one: old lessons for old problems because there's nothing new under the sun again to quote ecclesiastes nothing new under the sun the second reason to study philosophy is because it helps you train your mind it helps you expand the way that you think um everybody always talks about mental gymnastics being a bad thing and in or and when you justify something and we all know what I'm referring to when you're justifying something through mental gymnastics. That's a bad thing, yes. But it trains your mind in the same way that if you go to the gym and you exercise, it gets it helps you get stronger, it helps you get faster, it helps you become more limber and nimble. That's what studying philosophy and history can do. It helps you to think quicker on your feet. It helps you to formulate stronger arguments. It helps you to be more limber in the way you think. It helps you to recognize sometimes that things aren't always black and white and there's wiggle room in the way we see the world. And so it's one of the, I, I would attribute to the fact that I can do this podcast without a script to the fact that I have studied philosophy because it has helped me to formulate my thoughts in a semi-coherent manner. It has helped me to understand how to communicate with other people. It has helped me to be able to have better recall because I'm forced to meditate on things that I've read and not just depend on finding something through Google. Studying philosophy is the pursuit and love of wisdom. And wisdom, again, to go back to my first point, wisdom is the love and pursuit of goodness. And in that, it will help you lead a more beautiful life. So, I would like to wrap this up. I hope that this episode has given you some more reasons to study philosophy. And not not the, the French post-structuralists or the German deconstructionists, not Kantian epistemology or anything like that. I'm talking about the people who earnestly desired to live noble and virtuous lives. If I can recommend some starting off books, um, I, th I personally think one of the easiest reads in philosophy is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. I I personally love that book. I have read it a couple times, and every time I read it, I find myself picking something else out. So Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, um, I believe Xenophon writ, wrote a book on Socrates's Apology. I need to double check that, but I believe so uh, Xenophon wrote a book pertaining to Socrates, and that's a particularly enjoyable read. Um, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics is a little dense, but if you can find the golden nuggets in it, then I'd say it's well worth it. But really, just start off with something like Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. 
incredibly easy to read. Um, pick up a copy of Plato's Republic. I, I would say that there are probably better resources as far as Plato than his Republic, but it is pretty much the most well-known of his works. And yeah, um, just go out and pursue wisdom and enjoy the friends you make along the way. Some of them have been dead for 2,000 years. And that's really all it is. is it's the written word. These are, it's a message in a bottle reaching forward in time. In any case... Um, as a warning, if you are going to read philosophy, don't let your head get too big. Don't get too focused on the fact that you have the answers to miss the, and miss the actual significance of the answers themselves. Love the wisdom don't love the fact that you're wise. That you're wise. In any case, this has been the eleventh episode of the Old Code podcast. I know that this one is a little bit longer for a vacation uh, episode, but it's the new year, um, so. In any case. I hope you liked the last episode, and I hope you liked this episode. If you have any recommendations or any suggestions, feel free to let me know. There's a little survey at the bottom of Spotify, I believe, that just says, what did you think of this episode? Feel free to let me know. Also, I have an email listed in the show description. So just reach out to me. Let me know what you think. Bye for now.